Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Erin Judge. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Alumni Events at the College of Engineering and Applied Science. I'm excited to be here today with Civil, Environmental, and Architectural Engineering Professors Amy Javernick-Will and Abby Lyle for this next webinar in our alumni webinar series. As part of this series, we aim to showcase some of the amazing research that's happening at the college and bring our faculty directly to you for an exclusive look into their groundbreaking work. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our faculty speakers for today. Having attended the University of Colorado Boulder for both her bachelor and master's degrees, Professor Amy Javernick will was thrilled to return to CU after working in the design build construction industry and completing her PhD at Stanford. The Nicholas R. and Nancy D. Petrie Professor in Construction Engineering and Management and Associate Director of the Mortensen Center in Global Engineering and Resilience, Amy conducts research on disaster risk reduction and recovery and water and sanitation service delivery in resource constrained environments and organizational management and design. Abby Lyle is a professor of civil, environmental, and architectural engineering at CU. She earned undergraduate degrees in civil engineering at the school and the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University and graduate degrees at University College London and Stanford University. Abby's research primarily focuses on characterizing risks to the built environment from extreme events such as earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, and exploring the impacts of these risks on building occupants and community resilience. Professors, thank you so much for taking the time to share some of your work with our alumni and friends today. I'll go ahead and turn it over both to you. Great, thanks so much, Erin, and thank you all for joining us today. It's really a privilege to be able to present this work and collaborate with my friend, Abby Lyle. And we really wanted to give credit where credit is due. If you've done your graduate degree, you know that it's really the PhD students that are really conducting a lot of this work. And we wanted to give a special shout out to Dr. Breyer Goldwyn, who completed the work in Puerto Rico that we'll present today, and Dr. Casey Venable, who had done work um, in the Philippines. So you don't have to look too far to realize that globally, our communities are facing increased disaster risk. I pulled headlines yesterday um, that I've put into the slide. We had an earthquake strike Mexico, and a couple days before, we had Hurricane Fiona, who is, which is still on a path of destruction um, that's affecting our communities. So with this increased risk, we think about disasters as arising from very complex interactions, not only from the natural hazard itself, but between society and the built environment. And that is what Abby and I are really focused on with that intersection. We believe that we can reduce our risk by preparing both our communities and increasing the resiliency of our built infrastructure, such as housing. And we're really focused on housing over the last decade because we spend so much time in our homes. Not only is it our family and sleeping environment, it's often a place where we are working. Um, and so we really wanna focus on reducing the risk within housing. And we recognize that in most of the world's communities, um, this is done informally. And so what we mean by informal housing construction is where residents often hire and recruit assistance from builders, friends, or family who have learned about construction through experience. Um, and this is often driven by a need for affordable housing. Um, and it's often done where we may have weak regulatory environments where building codes may not be enforced or inspected. Um, for, for housing construction. So in these areas, the preferences of homeowners and the experience of builders become fundamental for what gets designed and built. Um, and so with, with that, we also have um, our subsequent structural performance because these preferences are really dictating what gets designed and built and therefore the structural performance of our homes. So we argue that we really need to focus on these perceptions. However, however there's really a dearth of um, studies that have examined these perceptions. 
And instead, we often rely on our post-disaster reconnaissance reports. And these are very important. These reports show us areas where there's common structural vulnerabilities or incidences of collapse and can lead to recommendations or technical guidance for safe construction. However, we argue that we really still need to systematically capture perceptions and understand this so that we can compare that to engineering assessments and identify areas where, where we may misalign or align um, and by identifying misalignments, we can then target interventions. So our research approach did both of this simultaneously. We wanted to really put the perceptions of housing safety at the forefront um, by studying builders um, who are engaged in informal construction as well as, as well as hardware store employees. So I know for me, I go into Lowe's or Home Depot and I may ask some questions and that happens globally. It happens in Puerto Rico as well. Um, and so we really wanted to understand those perceptions and what advice people were giving um, based upon that. And we wanted to compare this to multi-hazard engineering performance assessments of safety. Um, by doing so, we can then see where where these align and where these may misalign. And we particularly want to target misalignments that maybe do not only to just financial constraints, but where areas where people believe that it's due to training and just increased information. So we conducted this study in Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Rico um, experienced hurricanes Irma and Maria in September 2017. This U.S. Caribbean island um, has, is exposed to both hurricanes and earthquakes, and Hurricane Maria was particularly devastating, and it motivated our work. Over 1.4 million homes were damaged or destroyed. So we began our data collection in June 2019, recognizing that a lot that Puerto Rico experiences frequent hurricanes, also recognizing that it was a multi-hazard environment, but there had not been an earthquake in over a hundred years. And so shortly after data collection began, we actually experienced earthquakes in Puerto Rico. Those occurred from December, 2019 to January, 2020. There was a series of 40 earthquakes and aftershocks and these damaged or destroyed 10,000 homes. When we think about perceptions, often stories get lost over a century. Um, and so people had been more frequently considering hurricanes in their buildings, but now they began to consider this multi-hazard environment. And there's a quote from one of our interviewees that I particularly like. They indicated that's the dilemma in the tropics because you're safe in a concrete house for a hurricane, but not for an earthquake. Um, so we did investigate both hazards and people's perceptions to these hazards. What we ended up doing was completing over 60 interviews in field work. And you see a picture of um, some of us in the top left-hand corner that really helped to motivate our survey and what we were asking in our survey. That survey was distributed um, to every hardware store that we could locate, as well as informal construction workers over 15 months. And so we had around 350 surveys completed. Those surveys focused on prior disaster experience and construction experience, knowing that that motivated perceptions. It was focused on the expected hazard damage to the house that they would experience in different hazard events, the mitigation measures that they thought was important, construction practices that were being performed that they perceived to be unsafe, and then again, that reason for the unsafe practices. On the bottom left, you'll see that we were also doing field observations to conduct measurements and to understand what typical houses were being built for our engineering assessments. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Abby to talk about those engineering assessments. Thank you, Amy. So in parallel to all of those, that interviewing and surveying that we did, we also were working kind of, um, you know, in, at the same time on doing these engineering assessments. And our goal here really was to assess what are the risks of some of these houses and some of the features of these housings that can really amplify risk or make things better, make things safer. And, with the goal of actually quantifying what some of those risks are and what are the, what are the me measures that can really lead to improved safety for um, Puerto Rican communities. Um, so we started um, 
we, we did both earthquake and wind assessment. I'm gonna talk about both of them. I'm gonna start with the earthquake piece first. So here we did nonlinear dynamic analysis. So we made computer models of buildings. We basically ran them with earthquake ground shaking in, in the model and we saw what happened. And out of that, we produce a probabilistic assessment of, of, of what could happen to that building in an earthquake. Um, and we quantified it primarily in terms of the probability of collapse because that's really a measure of safety for, for residents. So I'm just gonna highlight some of our key findings from those seismic performance assessments and then show how we, we can fold those in um, with the perceptions to really um, think about targeting interventions. So one of the first things we observed um, from our models was that these open ground story houses are very vulnerable relative to other houses in the building stock. So we made a bunch of models of different houses with different characteristics. These ones that are kind of on stilts, so the living area is on the second floor and the ground area is mostly open for garage or um, maybe to reduce flood risk or whatever, um, those have particularly poor seismic performance. And you can see that in the, in the plot on the right. So on the x-axis of this plot, we have ground shaking intensity. On the y-axis, we have probability of collapse. The orange ones are these, these open ground story cases. And you can see compared to all the cases we looked at, the orange ones are generally at the top, meaning they had higher, high probability, higher probabilities of collapse. So this is one place where we really wanna think about what can be done to improve, um, improve performance, while also recognizing the important reasons why people build in this way. So we also tried to look at ways of mitigating the poor performance of these open ground story houses. So in this plot, we again in orange have those original open, open um, ground story cases. And then we looked at various retrofit strategies. So the black and the pink are the case where you say, well, I'm not gonna have an open ground story. I'm just gonna put masonry in fill um, and just have a two story house. Okay, so that can improve your performance. And what's happening there is just that masonry and fill um, is actually helping you to resist some of their seismic loads. Um, more appealing from the perspective of the reasons why people build these open ground story houses in the first place is the, um, let's see, the purple and the green cases, where you see that those are cases where we kept the columns, we're keeping the open thing, but we're just making those columns bigger and we're adding more reinforcement. And we can see that you can significantly reduce the probability of collapse um, with those, just making those columns bigger. So there, there's a place here where, they, where we can have the safety um, and also have the open ground story. Next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned we also did hurricane and wind assessment. Um, so in this case, we um, made mod, you know, computer models again, um, looked at typical wind pressures on roofs as a function of wind speed um, and use that to identify what parts of our roof is going, might fail um, and what characteristics of that roof could prevent um, failure of the roof system. So the first thing we learned from that wind assessment is that indeed, expected performance of the types of roofs, especially these wood roofs that they have are very common in Puerto Rico, um, is very poor. So our analysis showed um, that many such roofs would fail in even a category one storm. Um, we also showed though, ways of mitigating some of those failures. So the plot on the left is saying, okay, well, if your failure mode is that your metal roof panels fly off, um, here are some ways that you can address that failure mode. So you can put more nails, you can add thicker metal panels, um, that's the middle two options, and, or you can use umbrella umbrella nails. Okay, so this is, this is, these are things that will help reduce the loss of those roof panels in, in wind events. Next slide. Um, we're also, though worried not only about the panels being lost, but worried about the entire roof structure being lost. So this photo is actually from um, Puerto Rico this week, right, where we had Hurricane Fiona. In this case, you'll notice that um, Nelson's home here didn't only lose roof panels, the entire, the entire roof flew off. And so we need to think also about like, so with the roof panels, fly, if you're able to keep the roof panels secured, maybe by adding more nails, what does that mean? And in many cases, it could mean that the whole roof structure is vulnerable. So we did some analysis of that case as well. So what we found there is that if you secure the roof panels, then that's good, but it's not that good because you're basically moving the failure to another place. And in this case, you're moving it either to the connection between the roof and the walls or to the connections within the roof itself. And at those locations, we have a technology for that. So we have these you know, hurricane straps, 
are widely available, well-developed from an engineering perspective, and they really are effective at reducing the risk of the Perlin and Trust connections failing or the connection between the, um, the whole roof, the, the roof and the walls failing. And so you'll see later that we, we're going we're gonna to look more in detail about hurricane strap specifically and um, the adoption of that technology. I just want to emphasize one big challenge here, though, for, for builders and, and residents. Um, and to, to illustrate that, I'm going to go briefly to the Philippines, where we also did work on um, post-disaster housing and evaluating um, rebuilding processes. But I just like these pictures really well illustrate this point that I want to make. So um, the, the houses shown on these slides are um, any part of the Philippines that was very heavily impacted by Typhoon Yolanda in 2013. Um, Many international aid organizations provided houses. One such house that was provided by a major NGO um, is the one shown in these pictures. And they built, you know, I don't know, thousands of these houses um, at various places um, affected by Typhoon Yolanda. You can also see in these pictures that um, these roofs were like spectacular roofs. They had a lot of nails, fairly thick metal, um, kind of an edge around, you know, extra metal around the seams. They're hip roofs, meaning that there is a, a, a roof angle on four sides. Um, unfortunately, that had an unintended consequence, which is that amazing roof wasn't going to fly off for anything. And as, a, but the walls were not strong enough to withstand the pressures produced by the roof or produced by the wind on the roof if the, if the roof didn't fall off. So instead of this house on the left or the house on the right, which is also a house that just doesn't have walls anymore, instead of these households losing a few panels off their roof in the next typhoon, which was in December, 2020, um, they lost their entire house because the, there was not a, a, well, a good understanding of how if you fix the roof, that's great, but that may not be enough to actually get you to the performance you're looking at. And it's a similar problem in Puerto Rico where that we, are worried about the roof panels, yes, but we also want to make sure that we attend to what might happen after those roof, if those roof panels are strengthened, um, because the loss of an entire roof is much more catastrophic than the loss of a single panel. So we did this engineering work um, in parallel to these surveys, and then we went about trying to understand where where are is the engineering and the kind of builders' understanding really and really aligned. And where are there some differences with the goal of interrogating those differences to think about improving housing safety. So from the survey, we looked at particularly places where um, we, 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 we looked at places where either the builder said something wasn't important and we thought it was important or places where they just you know thought something was was important for a different reason maybe than we than we thought it was important. We also asked our survey participants, what was the reason for some of the unsafe building practices that they identified in others? And specifically, we asked them, we, we gave them, we, they had a lot of options, but they, let, they had a choice of technical construction capacity and financial constraints were some of the options. And, what we've, and we focused this part of the assessment on those that were attributed to technical construction capacity, arguing that that is a good place for engineering to be really useful because it's really a place where technical construction capacity um, is mattering. So on the basis of that comparison, we identified four misalignments. Um, and we're really going to focus in, in this presentation on, on this first one, which is that we didn't see builders prioritizing hurricane straps at key connections, um, but we know that they're important. I don't want to lose track, though, of some of the other things that we mentioned. So one of them, or the other things that we noticed, so one of them was that individuals associate heaviness with strength, which is from their experience with hurricanes, where heavy things perform better. But um, earthquakes are really like a mass times acceleration problem. So more mass creates bigger forces. And so, you know, there's a trade-off there with heaviness really presenting some problems in earthquakes if not appropriately designed for. Um, there's different strategies for combining reinforced concrete with masonry. One of those, which is called confined infill or confined masonry really allows masonry and infill to act together. Infill, the traditional infill approach where you build columns first and then kind of shove some masonry in there doesn't work as well. Um, and we and we didn't see that our builders really had a had a good recognition of what are the differences between them and what might be the advantages of some of the of the confined approach. And finally, 
Um, we did see a lot of builders talking about open ground stories with weak columns, not knowing how to avoid the problems with open ground story buildings um, and looking for solutions. So um, we're really gonna focus on this hurricane strap piece. So our wind assessment showed that hurricane straps can really improve the performance of these houses. So um, you'll see on the top left, hurricane straps are widely available in Puerto Rico at most hardware stores. Um, and we analyzed the case where they're at the truss to wall connections uh, or rafter to wall connections and also the case where at the Perlentia truss connections. And at both locations, hurricane straps perform better than any other option that you might have for combining for connecting those pieces of wood together. And so then I, I think Amy's up next and she's gonna show some of the survey data that we had relating to these questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Abby. So as Abby showed you, we really, um, we really wanted to focus on this misalignment because builders were prioritizing securing roof panels rather than those roof connections that Abby had mentioned being particularly important. And so when we look at the survey data here on the y-axis, you can see the percent of survey respondents. Um, and we found that um, our survey respondents, only 45%, where we'd like to see a much higher number, um, thought that an important mitigation measure would be using hurricane straps, given the importance of that in our engineering assessments. Instead, these builders were really prioritizing adding more nails and screws, using thicker roof panels, things that are important, but as Abby showed you from some of those systems, you know, perspective can, can really create catastrophic losses. Um, additionally, looking at the responses to the expected damage in a future hurricane like Maria, we see that most people believe that the panels will be torn off, so 71%, compared to the failures that we were really expecting, 51% um, with the trust to wall failure and 45% to the Perlin to trust. When we looked at our interview responses and what people were saying why they believed this, we really found that that experience um, was really motivating um, their desires uh, in terms of what they were prioritizing. And in this case, people believed, you know, they saw and witnessed roof panels flying away. Um, that's described as zinc roofs um, here. And it was a lot of times because of the experiences from past hurricanes that they were prioritizing this um, instead of really looking at the holistic roof structure um, and in that system perspective. As Abby and I both mentioned in the past, we also wanted to know why, and as engineers, we, we can focus more on the technical capacity component. And so when people indicated why they were not including hurricane straps, we found that financial constraints were still a reason, 52% indicated that. However, 71% of respondents indicated that it was due to a lack of technical training um, and and understanding of the hurricane straps. So that really ended up um, guiding us in terms of our first intervention to focus on. Um, and so we ended up collaboratively designing, piloting, and evaluating a capacity building approach um, in Puerto Rico with two big goals. Um, one was to increase self-efficacy or the perceived ability to take action, to change practices, and to mitigate risk. And then also to, to increase knowledge and mitigation measure efficacy so that they knew how to use and install hurricane straps. So um, our PhD student Briar Goldswin and uh, undergraduate research assistant Cole Velasquez took, took time to really interview community-based organizations that were working in Puerto Rico and understand what approaches worked well um, in terms of training and, and increasing some of this capacity. And from those interviews, they developed four propositions. Um, and so those included making sure that we share recommendations and engage communities alongside trusted local groups. This is really important probably everywhere, but particularly important in Puerto Rico. And so we really took time to partner with very specific community-based organizations so that the work could continue and that it wasn't gonna be a one-off um, training that would be forgotten and that the local group was trusted. 
We also made sure to combine lectures with hands-on learning. I think most of us can recognize the importance of, of physically doing things in addition to having information received through a PowerPoint slide. And so on the right-hand side, you can see a demonstration house that Cole and Breyer had built where people could get experience with the hurricane straps and understanding some of the concepts that were being presented um, in the lectures. We thought it was really important if we were going to build self-efficacy and trust and understanding in the importance of hurricane straps that we really listened. Um, so part of that was positioning. If you saw all the pictures that I had presented from this, everybody's in a circle, everybody's on an equal playing field, and there was a lot of time to discuss and to address questions that we're, people were having or concerns that they were having with different approaches so that we both understood and were, were really collectively creating these recommendations. Um, and then finally, we incentivized attendance, knowing how important um, that was um, to, to have respondents come. So Breyer and Cole it then iteratively piloted and evaluated the design. They conducted three sessions with our community-based partners, two of them. They did this in groups with just trainers, um, with just apprenticeships, which is who the trainers are training, and then with both. And in this process, they adjusted the, the session to really address people's questions and concerns. Um, and they were measuring self-efficacy through statements that indicated that they had increased ability um, to actually mitigate disaster risks and that they knew um, how and when to use hurricane straps. Because of that dialogue, we learned a lot more about how hurricane straps are actually being installed. And one of the things that really quickly became apparent was that well, even when hurricane straps were being used, they often were being used with two screws versus four nails. Um, so that meant that we had to really like kind of address why nails were used and why we needed all four. And so that included, you know, really recommendations of when a hurricane strap would fail. And so with the four nails and it will fail at or after it reaches its four potential versus if you use insufficient nails, it's, it's going to it's going to fail before that, given the, the forces. Um, we also needed to address nails versus screws. And so people were installing screws and they were often using the two screws. Um, and so we really needed to talk about why we would want nails versus screws. And so that really got into talking um, about shear strength. And, and really addressing that screws would be sheared off if they were used in a hurricane strap versus nails um, are really designed for hurricane straps because of their sheer strength. Um, and, and talking about it and giving different um, indications of you know, when screws are important and when we need nails. So overall, um, when people were talking, we really found that there was positive changes for increased self-efficacy. Um, people believed that they could change their practices, and then they often were less concerned about the material costs. So for instance, you know, they said, oh, it's $35 to make sure your roof doesn't blow away, and it's a common myth that they that that um, these are too expensive. However, we also heard trainers express trepidation and concern with some of the challenges, including the labor practice of this. And so there was a lot more, it was much more common um, to, to use screws. And so they believed that the hammer would require, would require increased skill training in hammer practice and that it may take longer than to actually install the roof properly with some of the hurricane straps. And now I'm going to turn it over to Abby, who's talking about our continued work here. Yeah, so we we are um, working more to try to improve improve the training and make sure that um, our key partners have access to the information they need to support their efforts to improve housing safety. Um, one of the additional partners that we haven't talked about yet is is Simpson Strongkai, um, who is the, the the major supplier of hurricane straps to the island of Puerto Rico. Um, and they are making sure that these are widely available. Um, and so we've been working closely with them to try to, first of all, connect them to some of these organizations because some of the organizations, you know, like really feel, um, are, are really feeling there's a lot of value of talking directly to the supplier about how should we be building with these hurricane straps. And so we've helped um, create some of those relationships. And then also, um, you know, 
It's actually pretty complicated to figure out which hurricane strap you need. Her Simpson Strontai has many, many options. Um, and so trying to help develop some materials that can really help a, a builder understand like now that like, if I, if I have a whole store full of hurricane straps, which is the one or two that I really need? Um, which sizes do I need without doing, you know, these are not typically designed structures. So is there, you know, which sizes can, can I rely on um, even if I'm not able to do calculations about wind pressures, for example. So um, we just wanted to share, um, to finish up, share some concluding, some concluding thoughts. Um, the first one is that housing is super vulnerable. We see this all the time and it's so important, um, but there are really are ways to improve earthquake and hurricane performance. Um, but there's, you cannot just simply take an engineering solution off the shelf and, and apply it in a particular context or expect that it'll work. And so understanding perceptions of what is being built and also really why people are building. So, you know, we had some really revealing conversations with people about why they were choosing screws and it had to do with their concerns about wood and concerns about too, putting too many holes in the wood. And, and so really understanding why those practices are happening allows us to understand, okay, what are the opportunities to potentially share some technical details that can help us um, really get to safer housing. So our, you know, we, develop this method or idea around comparing perceptions and engineering assessment and really focusing on those misalignments, which we think are the best places, you know, the, the, the highest impact places to, to target capacity building efforts. Um, I also wanna highlight here that cost matters, but that resource constraints are often not the critical or only barrier to these improvements. And one of the things we really found in doing this work um, is, is that it's really important to understand what is the barrier. Is it a perception of cost? Is it um, a perception about a particular technology? Is there uncertainty about a particular type of hazard or risk that is not well understood? Um, and so we really found it powerful to really get at like, okay, so what are the reasons why people are not doing this? And so, cause that helped us target ideas and, and to technical construction ideas that could really be potentially useful in, in this context. Um, and so I guess in conclusion, I, I, wa I wanna leave, leave with the thought that um, it, disaster resilient housing is a possibility. I think it's a possibility for houses with, with widely varying resources, but as we've seen in Colorado with fires and as we see in Puerto Rico with hurricanes and earthquakes um, and you know, many, many other examples, right? There are real challenges to actually getting these technologies implemented and having people build ways that will really improve community or, or household resilience and um, understanding what's being built and why it's being built in conjunction with what are some of those engineering solutions is, is a really powerful way to, to identify ways we can move forward for safer disaster resilient housing. Um, Amy and I wanna thank our amazing collaborators and students. So we've had Three PhD students do parts of this work by our goals and Casey Venable and Polly Murray who did the um, seismic engineering assessments. Um, undergraduate researchers, including Cole Velasquez and Meredith Lockheed who did the wind performance assessments. A colleague, Professor Matthew Koshman who's in the Department of Communication at CU and many local research assistants um, who did the real on the ground labor of going to these hardware stores, talking with people through the survey as you see in the picture. Um, at, at the bottom. Um, we also are deeply indebted to all of the people in Puerto Rico who spent so much time talking to us and helping us understand the ways in which they build, why they want to build that way and ways in which um, we could help answer some of their questions from an, from an engineering perspective. And finally, this work is supported by the National Science Foundation. Um, and we um, were really excited by this opportunity to, to work together and work on this important project. Um, in this, you know, um, amazing places, Philippines and Puerto Rico, both of which, you know, Amy and I have such, you know, affection for and enthusiasm for continuing to work in. Great, thank you both so much. Um, we'd now like to open it up to questions. So I'll just remind everyone in the audience, um, please just hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see that Q&A box. Um, you can go ahead and submit your questions there. Uh, so we do have a question, a few questions that have come through already. Um, we'll start with this one um, from Nicole. Uh, could you please share more about factors influencing how a building responds to different destructive catalysts? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. I think, you know, it depends on the, it, the, the, the source of the destructive catalyst has a big influence on what factors you need to consider in your building. So for earthquakes, for example, we're worried about con reinforcing in concrete. We're worried about um, deformation capacity. So a building being able to move versus, you know, kind of failing brittly um, in, in, in an earthquake. Um, for wind, um, roofs are a big problem, as I hope I demonstrated in the presentation, and the ways of connecting that roof to each other and to the rest of the system um, are, are, are critical. Um, you know, for wildfires, we get to different things, right? We get to decisions about siting and, and um, roofing and, you know, landscaping and things like that. And so it does, it does really depend on the catalyst. However, as we see in Puerto Rico, one of the things that the engineering community hasn't done as well as I think we should have is think about those things together, right? So one of the things we really found when we talked about looked in Puerto Rico on this project was that there are practices that make a ton of sense from hurricane resistance, like these open ground story houses, and do not make a ton of sense without some modification for seismic performance. Um, and so, you know, we, we looked at um, weight and, you know, some of these other trade-offs basically between hurricane and seismic performance. It really tried to focus on, I know I presented seismic and wind assessment as, as separate, but we tried to focus on what are the things that you can do that gives you kind of two resistance to two hazards um, ra rather than just one or even creating something negative for others. So that's, you know, the, this idea of retrofitting the columns of these open ground story houses, making them bigger. Um, that was a place where there's like a, you know, that really helps in earthquakes. It doesn't take away from the value of having a ground story that's open. So your water, as we've seen this week, there's been so much water in Puerto Rico, right? You can imagine how appealing it would be to have a house that was raised and you had, there was some room for water to go through. It doesn't take away from that. And also, you know, we found in our interviews and surveys that people were super interested in like, wait, so how, like, if I make my column four inches bigger, that will really help. And they were like, and they just, they, that was a question that a lot of builders really have. Okay. So that didn't work. They saw that clearly in the news media, these columns didn't work, but like what, how big do I really need to make them? What can that really look like? Um, and so that's a place where the multi-hazard perspective and also really understanding what was of interest to builders um, was really valuable in, in kind of bringing that, those pieces all together. Thank you. Uh, we have another question that came in from Bill. Um, Bill asks, what role, if any, does the local AHJ play in construction quality assurance, i.e. inspections, to help make sure that the hurricane anchors and fasteners are properly installed? Is that a barrier to quality of installed work? Amy, you want me to take this one? Uh, sure, and I can add in after you. Yeah, so in, in Puerto Rico specifically, um, the there, there is very little access to or enforcement of regulations. So there's a lack of understanding of what, what those regulations are. Um, many of the local municipalities simply don't have the, the, the staffing or the expertise to um, admit, to do any of that regulatory work, even, even, even if they were wanting to. And so, you know, Bill's question is a really good one, is that a, you know, a local authority having jurisdiction could really be playing a strong role in quality assurance and inspections. Um, they, they aren't in Puerto Rico. And so we really focus on, um, you know, how can builders and communities, you know, do this work themselves to make their communities safer rather than focusing on the regulation. But I, I don't know, Amy, did you have something to add? I think, I think you did a, a great job of explaining that. I mean, I think even in Colorado, we see maybe that, you know, housing construction isn't necessarily having um, codes and inspections enforced. I wanted to tie in my response also because I saw another question, Erin, come in from Juan about, could you share more about success stories? And so I'm gonna tie my answer to both of these together. When we looked in um, the Philippines, we studied, we studied a different set of, of housing construction. And we, we studied those that were um, completed by non-governmental organizations. And as part of that study, we really looked at, okay, what processes um, worked to increase the safety of homes and what processes worked to increase satisfaction. Um, and we found a couple of things like community, community participation in both was really vital. 
But for the safety of homes, we found that community participation was particularly important in the early involvement, like considering location and some design. What was really critical for, for, for safe housing was government involvement. So having that permitting and the enforcement of, of codes and inspecting through the building of tranche systems um, really became important to making sure that um, those houses were being constructed safe. So I do think it's a combination of uh, really government enforcement um, with community involvement. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question we have is from Russ um, asking, concerning industry support, did Simpson help support the study or was it exclusively confined to technical support in the application and use of their engineered project products? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we've really been um, working on building a, a, a relationship with Simpson and we, they, they have given us some support for the current state. So most of our financial support, the vast majority came from the National Science Foundation. But in our, in our current work, especially in this work in terms of trying to clarify um, guidance on how to use hurricane straps, um, Simpson has, has given us some support for that effort. We're really grateful for that. It's here, thank you. Uh, for our next question, did you learn how to provide consulting on the size and placement of steel rebar and the area and recipe of the concrete? So in our engineering assessments, we looked at this question, like how much steel and what types of concrete, how, how can you mix your concrete to achieve the outcomes that you want of safe, safe homes? Um, we haven't focused on yet on, on looking at training for that, partic that particular issue, although we've had a lot of informal conversations with people about like what that might look like. Um, I think there's a separate maybe point here in this question is, is that there is a, um, you know, these communities do have difficulty accessing, you know, engineering and service, engineering, architectural design, design services in general. Um, and so I think just thinking about like, you know, so let's say a builder does really want to do some calculations or have someone verify something for a practice they're doing. Um, a lot of these communities do have, do struggle to, ac to access that information. Um, even though there, you know, there's obviously many talented en engineers in Puerto Rico, but some of these, some of these communities are, are really fairly isolated from that, that design expertise. And there just isn't much design work and consulting going, going on with some of these communities. And I'll just add to that that we did hear a lot of a lot of questions regarding regarding reinforcement and where it should be placed. Um, and so I do think it's an important area to investigate further. And some of our some of our past studies in the Philippines and and work that other people have done in Indonesia has focused again on perceptions. And so when when how how does training stick? And so you may start off with really great recommendations, but then over time, it's like three inches to six inches to a foot. And, and some of the reasons and rationale become lost. So I think like that longitudinal study, um, it just reminded me of reinforcing <laughs> but, but the longitudinal study of how, how that sticks and um, that knowledge sticks and gets told in stories, I think is really important. Well, and reinforcing and concrete is an example of a building practice that's really tricky, right? Because like you can't see it, right? You, it really is a devil is in the details kind of problem. And once it's built, you don't know how much reinforcing was put in. Um, and so, you know, it, it becomes a place where everybody has, certainly in Puerto Rico and in many other places that I've worked, you know, everybody has their secret or not secret concrete recipe with you know so many wheelbarrows of this and so many buckets of this and the buck and then the buckets change sizes or something you know so there's all this complexity around that particular building practice, which which is kind of amazing given it's like probably the most ubiquitous material in the world right but there's a lot of you know it's it's really hard to see what's actually going on and also hard to know it's really easy to make it one inch smaller because you don't have enough material and then another inch smaller. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Arthur, and I think it sort of touches on what you had mentioned previously regarding financial constraints and how that is something that um, is still a barrier, even if it is not the only barrier. Um, curious if that's something that your team thought to address, or perhaps you have any ideas around um, how that can be addressed in the future. Yeah, you know, I mean, we did really focus on the expertise that we could bring to the study, and so we were really focused on 
our engineering um, our, our engineering knowledge. And that's why we specifically targeted the technical capacity building. We do recognize the financial constraints and that is a huge barrier. Um, and so we do hope that future work can address this. And, you know, we have connections with, with Simpson Strong Tie. We've also talked to FEMA, who's really interested in our, in our research. I think that there's a variety of funding channels, but it really remains problematic. And we really recognize that um, as we try to really ensure equitable safety of housing um, in the future. Great, thank you for addressing that. Um, one of the last questions we have here comes from Josh uh, asking, what was the most challenging aspect of conducting this research in your mind? Maybe that was working with various stakeholders or perhaps assessing the activity of um, structural performance. Um, what, what were your thoughts? Do you want me to start there, Abby? So see if Amy and I give the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that um, I would say like really working with stakeholders and conducting this research when COVID hit. Um, so um, really trying to think about doing right by the people that this work affects and how does that look and are we taking up too much time um, in, in our collection and helping us understand their context and their perception so that we can we can do our work well. So that was always like forefront of my mind of how can we really like benefit, um, you know, benef benefit the people that are helping us do the do the work. And so part of that was, I, know, I think our PhD students would say working with stakeholders and doing that in COVID in a remote environment, um, when there's a lot of different challenges affecting affecting people at once. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say the same thing is that, you know, we, we, you'll notice that we did the interviews and the surveys like basically from 2020 and 2021. And so there was a lot of um, a, a lot of complications from lockdowns and not being able to travel ourselves. And then also just like, you know, just to put a really emphasize how much work it is to understand these perceptions and work with these stakeholders, just like there's so much relationship building that goes on, you know, like over WhatsApp sitting in coffee shops, um, you know, like, like, and, and like that work cannot be skipped, right? That is such an important part. It, or you don't get the meaningful answers and the real like types of conclusions that can actually impact people. And so, um, yeah, that's a really challenging part, which is not to say the engineering isn't hard. That's all, that's also, that's also hard. Um, but the, you know, making sure we're bringing everybody along with us and that it's really serving these communities that, you know, we have, Amy and I share this like real strong goal of using this to really make people's houses safer in the end. Um, that's a big challenge. Great, thank you. A uh, couple more questions. Um, do you have a rough idea of the man hours or monetary value of the study as it was performed? And in addition to that, uh, did you engage the student engineers without borders chapter in this project? So I may start with the the students, our graduate students are part of the Mortensen Center in Global Engineering and Resilience. Um, so that's just a, that's a certificate that they did during their graduate studies. Um, some of them were motivated from past EWB work, but um, we didn't specifically um, reach out to the EWB chapter. We also engaged a number of uh, undergraduate assistants who also, we're doing EWB or Mortensen Center involved involved research, but it wasn't a direct collaboration. And then, hmm, I don't know how to answer them. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on that question, Abby? Well, I will. I mean, you know, the the dollar value of the grant is public public information. It's a, it's about half a million dollars. Um, I think that what that hides, well, you know, like that grant, in addition to supporting the work for sports students working towards their PhD, right, grant models are complicated. Um, so it's not kind of a direct, like, one to one, but but that's the dollar amount of the grant. Um, I will also say, obviously, like, there's a lot of other, we, we pulled together a lot of pieces in addition to that grant. So I mentioned we have the support from Simpson, but also, you know, like the University of Colorado pays Amy and my salary for 
nine months of the year, you know, and it, so like, there's just a broad, there's a lot of other sources that kind of go into that too. Um, so I don't know if that's really the true cost, but anyway, that's the dollar value of the grant. Uh, well, and I will say like, we, we not only did the study in Puerto Rico, but we also did the study for the NSF in, in the Philippines. And those are two different subsets of population. So um, Puerto Rico is self-construction. And as I mentioned in the Philippines, it was really built by non-governmental organizations. Um, so th that was that was the difference. And we also had funding from uh, the Department of Education who provides graduate assistantships for in areas of national need. So a lot of different sources. And we really hope that the impact though of our grant extends you know, far, far beyond that initial monetary investment. Great, thank you so much. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of our presentation today. Um, thank you again, Professors uh, Javernick Will, Professor Leal, or Lyle, I apologize. <laughs> um, we appreciate your time today. We appreciate your presentation.